the spiritual map. Cogito ergo sum, Latin, for I think, therefore I am. This proves not only existence, but fundamental duality. The thinker and the thought are different kinds of things. The things which exist must exist as pattern, because only pattern allows for both the physical, or the thinker, and the non-physical, spiritual, or thought, to be real, as they must be. Physical patterns are given words, which are then bounded by our common understandings of the patterns they represent. This, plus the patterns that we put them together in, is language. Internal patterns are also given words, but those words describe experience or relationships between things rather than things themselves. Love is one example, math is another. A valid worldview proceeds from what must be and what cannot be. Intellectual maturity is the process of closing one's mind by discovering these truths and thereafter insisting upon them. On the scale of the universe, everything is one makes sense because the universe doesn't care whether particles are together or separate, part of the table or the chair or the air. But we exist on the human scale where such things matter. The universe is a different level of reality with different rules. Meaning only exists on the human scale. If animals experience something like meaning or consciousness, it is on a different level of reality from ours, just as they are on a different level than plants and plants than rocks. If Gaia, the world, or the internet are conscious, it is in some sense which exists on a different scale than what we understand and would need its own word because it would be an inherently different sort of experience. AI will exist in a different sort of sense, and an octopus octopus, or an alien or a god would be another sense. Everything is a dimension, whether it be the amount of blueness, the amount of leftness, the amount of richness, etc. The dimensions we normally understand are those of time and space, but any metric which can be represented as a two-dimensional or higher scale can be considered a dimension. And if you can move things and and you can move things about in that space according to its own internally coherent rules. This does not necessarily imply that there is a clear division. When that does happen, it's called emergence. Emergence is what happens when you move from one metaphor at one level of complexity or understanding to another. Consciousness, for example, is an emergent attribute of the brain. Our brains are extremely small relative to the universe, or even the world, or even the tiny little worm of time wandering about the planet which represents our entire lives. Everything we do is pattern recognition, and our thought processes are heuristics means of simplifying the complex universe into similar patterns that we can work with on various cognitive scales of complexity. This means it is extraordinarily ridiculous to believe that we can understand the, even the most minute particle of something as incredibly much bigger than our brains as God or infinity. We must settle for the idea that the most we can ever understand of the universe and how it all fits together must fit into something the size of a football, our brains. And that's what I'm attempting to do for you here. The best way to understand this pattern recognition, for most human purposes, is through narrative. The world is the stories we tell ourselves about it, and we are the stories we tell ourselves. In this sense, and only this sense, we can create our own universe. This is helpful for society because, collectively, we can change our story anytime we want, just like we get to pick our own meaning of life. <clears throat> Everything is a cosmic soup. Energy twists into particles, particles twist into stuff. Just as you explain the world differently to a college student than a kindergartner, there are patterns which work better at one level of reality or another. The physical world is exactly as it appears, but not necessarily exactly as it seems. In other words, what you see may be a perfect replica, so you think you see something other than what you actually do see. You seem to see the real thing. This is a limitation of our understanding of the world, plus physical filters in our senses, of course. The real world is that which we sense. That's what the word means. If there's some other level of reality outside physical embodiment, we can't test it. We can't verify it as being empirically real. It must exist per it may exist perfectly as concept, but not as reality. There are only two ways of knowing things, empirical probability or logical necessity. Anything else is a feeling which is only real in its own context. The world of concepts, however, is still real in its own sense. We have patterns in our brains which are as real there as tables and chairs are in the physical world. But the spiritual world works by different rules. This is what I call spiritual math. Science is the best compilation of all human knowledge and understanding of ourselves and the universe. If any other concept is contrary to science, it is much more likely that it is wrong than that science is. 
Spiritual math can be developed to work out practical solutions to problems which are not empirically based. For example, there is a formula for justice. Restitution plus redress plus rehabilitation equals justice. There's much damage caused to the search for truth when people claim that patterns from one realm can work according to the rules of the other, where the cognitive patterns are the same as or able to interact with physical ones in ways they cannot. But in the spiritual world, where our thoughts and opinions and ideas and wishes reside as real patterns, which really affect our external behavior, there are also patterns that describe how these things interact. Manners is one potential example of that sort of concept. The only difference between concept and reality is the single attribute of empirical existence. This difference is essential in understanding how the universe fits together. Everything is infinite in all directions. Even if that was not the case, we have no evidence to the contrary. We cannot imagine what it must mean for the universe to go on forever, or for time. But we can see no end, so our null hypothesis, or default belief, must be that it does not. This is because, in the absence of any evidence that the universe does end, the tiny evidence that it seems infinite gives us greater than 51% evidence in favor of that hypothesis. Spiritual math. Likewise, every time in the past that we have tested for smaller levels of the universe, we have found them. Another bit of spiritual math is that for practical purposes, 51% is as good as 100%, because nothing else can exceed it. You can never have greater than 100% total certainty. However, most certainty is overlapping ranges rather than specific levels, so other means must be used to make decisions. Normally, instinct or cognitive biases, thanks to genetics, or filters due to personal experience, are a low-level activator that we then explain to ourselves as something more in line with the higher level character we ascribe to ourselves. It is most sensible to believe that there is no end to anything because we can see no end. We cannot measure the edges of space or time. We cannot plumb the depths of size or the loveliness of beauty. Even concepts can be considered at increasing or lesser levels of complexity, such as explaining economics. An expert is someone who understands his subject well enough to explain it at whatever level is necessary. Everything which can happen, happens, and that is exactly one thing. Everything which does happen had a 100% chance of happening. And if we believe otherwise, it is only because we did not have full enough information to make that prediction. Everything is causal in all directions, with infinite speed on every level of interaction. The effects of causality spread through the entire fabric of the universe, instantly everywhere, all the way down through the infinitely smaller levels of speed and interaction. When you move left, the entirety of existence moves an equivalent amount to the right, on average. Everything is predetermined and inevitable, from the beginning of time to the end of time. We are observers riding the rails of our mind, or body, or senses, or experience, or biology, or chemistry, or psychology, or physics, or emotions, or relationships, or society, or luck, or whatever filter you choose to apply. Everything is a metaphor for life. Causality does not inherently mean that there is always a direct observable reaction, but it does mean that the slack must be taken up somewhere, even if it's on a scale we cannot comprehend. If time speeds up somewhere, it slows down somewhere else. Think of reality like marbles in a fishbowl. Our comprehension of this event is limited in temporal scale to the speed of our neuronal connections, just as our comprehension of physical scale is limited to the parallax of our vision. Our experience of the universe is a causal one, and until non-causality can be proven in some sense, which, despite what common people seem to believe about quantum mechanics, simply isn't true, it must be our null hypothesis. The existence of even the tiniest subjective particle or unit of energy would instantly require the entire system to be subjective, because that thing could interact with anything else at any time. Or, it is bound by rules of complexity which we don't understand, and therefore is indeterminate, not uncausal. The brain is the empirical basis for our spiritual world. The mind is the collection of concepts and preferences which we hold in it. <clears throat> our consciousness is a feedback loop in the brain that notices itself noticing, but most of the time it isn't in use. Our experience is the story we tell our mind about what our deterministic brain did. Logic trumps emotion. This is not because logic is better because that is subjective, depending on the desired result. It is because it is empirically testable, better at producing desired results. Empirically testably better at producing desired results. If emotion is the direction of travel, logic is the engine. They're yin-yang. You can be rational or logical about emotional or spiritual things and accommodate them perfectly, but if you try to make decisions which require rationality with emotions, you'll fail consistently. 
The proper framework for society is a strict set of rules based upon necessity, which is the foundation for any further endeavor, within which freedom is allowed as much room as possible to flourish. The mandate of government is to provide this framework, and as much else as the citizen citizenry give them the power to provide on their behalf. The government must reasonably provide a viable alternative to its own rules in order to not be a slave state. The social contract is only valid when you can reasonably opt out. Everyone deserves a share of everything. We are at a minimum. There are at minimum three attributes required to be a good and effective leader. Knowledge, intelligence, and conscientiousness. Law must be based solidly on the harm principle, and no one must be held responsible for effects beyond what they could reasonably have foreseen, or prevented, or controlled. Because everything is predetermined, this effectively rules out punishment. Remedies must be appropriate in style as well as degree. The death penalty, if ever used, must be for practical necessity, never retributive purposes, or else the central pillar of all society, the inherent worth of life, has crumbled. There is a critical difference between responsibility and blame, just like negative or positive involvement in harm, in a harm. In other words, making something happen versus allowing it to happen. There are levels of justice, injustice, and anti-justice. In life, certain experiences lead to certain lessons, and if you don't have those experiences, you did not learn those lessons. Motherhood is a good example. The most important right is the, to the full exploration and development of your character. If that is granted, all else follows. Compound interest applies to success of any kind, not just finances. It is critically important, therefore, to educate children well. They ought to be taught how to think, what to think, and why, in that order. That's how the universe works. The two sides of the duality, physical and spiritual, coexist so many, like so many human metaphors in a yin-yang configuration. Our spiritual, of the spirit, not religious, desires, emotions, and priorities give us incentive to live and to accomplish specific tasks. Rationality, empirical truth, shows us the way to accomplish those objectives. So that, in a nutshell, is everything you need to know about the universe. I use some words in very specific ways, uh, so I'll be happy to clarify anything that anyone has any questions about. And in the future, I will return to those uh, thoughts one paragraph at a time and explain them a little more fully and answer any questions that have come up. So, thanks for watching.